Thank you, Reverend Lawson. We appreciate you allowing the Houston Public Library to record and share with our customers your experience in the civil rights movement here in Houston and also your strong association with Martin Luther King. We know that you served for many, many years as a prominent leader both at Willer Avenue Baptist Church and also in your struggle to make sure that Houston and the African Americans that lived here had the same rights moving forward. And we appreciate again this time with you. Well, first of all, you're welcome. And then second of all, thank you for thinking of all that stuff. <laughs> thank you. Um, I read recently that during 1963, shortly after you came to Willer Avenue Baptist Church here in Houston, um, that your church uh, was the only church that extended an invitation to Martin Luther King. Can you tell us a little bit about that time in Houston and about that particular visit? Yes. You have to first of all look at a context. In the 1960s, indeed in the 1950s, J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI. And those were McCarthy years. And there was a great search for communists. And Dr. King, uh, who was a liberal trying to make a change in the American society, uh, was called a communist by J. Edgar Hoover. At that time, a close associate of J. Edgar Hoover was the president of the National Baptist Convention, J. H. Jackson. Now, this is the largest body of black churches in the nation. So J. H. Jackson passed on that word that King was a communist and pastors, uh, pastors all over the nation, therefore uh, sort of boycotted King in any place he came. When he came to Houston, the word had gotten out that this communist liberal leader was coming to Houston and therefore no, no Baptist pastors would invite him into their churches. We had just gotten started and our church had a community outreach emphasis and we, we were very much disciples of Dr. King. So we, we invited him to come to Wheeler Avenue. Wheeler Avenue was a young church, just a year old, and we were still in a low frame structure, mm -hmm. but he was willing to come to our church. That's basically what happened. My goodness, and what is your testimony from the faith of yourself and also being a, a faith leader of your church in providing him that time for them to feel safe and secure to do that? Well, first of all, the theme of my faith is what Jesus responded to the Pharisees when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And he responded that the great commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with everything within your being and, and that you should love your neighbor as yourself. So the idea of reverence and concern for people became our, therm, our theme. And this was largely what it was that led us to follow Dr. Martin Luther King. He was, he was a disciple of, uh, of, of Gandhi, and he was one who believed that what Nelson Mandela was doing in South Africa was the best thing to do, that, that you should be uh, vigilant and aggressive, but nonviolent. And so this said to me that just as God, uh, Gandhi uh, favored his Hindu faith, and as King, who was a Baptist preacher, fa favored his, his Christian faith, that both of them were doing what we should be doing. They were loving their God and they were serving their neighbor. And that's pretty much uh, the kind of philosophy we followed. Thanks for sharing that. I know you've said before that given time to appreciate Dr. King's influence and achievements, we can see him simply not as a leader of the African Americans, but as a moral leader for all Americans and much of the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that transformation and your views of how that began to occur for you? Well, I was among all the people who knew of Dr. King, who had some idea of who he was and what he was about, didn't know him personally. Mm -hmm. But at that time, at least I knew of him. And uh, one of the things that I was concerned about was that there were so few people at the top, so few leaders, uh, who seemed to want who seemed to want to identify with him, grassroots people, uh, people in the lower socio socioeconomic uh, areas, were willing to follow him. So he had a massive following, but it was not a following of uh, ministers and doctors and lawyers and engineers. But after his death, 
The unfortunate thing is that we began to appreciate him. So after his death, uh, there are schools and streets and hospitals, every place named after him. There's a massive parade that is going on this weekend. Uh, and, and I think that Dr. King would not have appreciated institutions being named after him or parades or banquets. I think that he would certainly have appreciated more uh, people carrying on the movement. But you're right, uh, he never thought of himself as just a black leader. He always thought of himself uh, as a leader of, of human beings. And he said quite often that his dream was that the time would come when white children and black children could play together. And I think that, uh, that his picture of, of his movement was, was one that, that made us uh, accept the, the morality uh, of, of, of unity uh, rather than, uh, than, than the exaltation of a certain segregated sub-community. Reverend Lawson, I know you have your own history of how you supported the civil rights in Houston. In particular, you were involved with desegregating the Houston area schools and also raised money to bail the Texas Southern University students out of jail after a sit-in at the Wine Garden's lunch counter. Can you kind of describe what drove you to become involved in those two particular cases and enlarge the civil rights movement in Houston? Okay, you're asking about uh, the, the desegregation of schools, and you're asking about the desegregation of the Wines Garden uh, lunch counter. Uh, the desegregation of the lunch counter happened first. Okay. And then the desegregation of the schools happened second. Let's go back to the, to the desegregation of the lunch counter. This was probably about 1964. I don't remember the exact year. But at that time, there were student boycotts occurring all over the South. Uh, and they were boycotts against the bus desegregation or against desegregation of department stores, a number of different kinds uh, of segregation. And students were pro protesting against that. Uh, that was not happening in Texas. I was on the campus of Texas Southern University. I was Baptist chaplain. And so students came to our chaplain's quarters and they said, uh, kids in North Carolina and South Carolina and Alabama and Mississippi are all protesting and we're not protesting here. Can we, can we go down to Wine Gardens, which is right here in our neighborhood and which is, which is where the post office is now, by the way, uh, and, 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 and protest against segregation there. And my wife and I uh, tried to dissuade them from doing that saying that their parents had sent them to Houston, to Texas Southern University for a different purpose, and they should not squander their parents' efforts uh, because they, they would probably be put in jail and have their records smeared for life. And, and they did not listen to my dissuasion. They said, well, if you won't help us, then we'll find some other leader who will. They didn't find another leader. What they did was just go on down the wine gardens and sit on those stools. There were 17 of them, and the police had been alerted and so they came to wine gardens waiting for the students to protest. And as they protested, uh, 17 of them were pulled off the stools and put into paddy wagons. And then 17 other students would take their place. And they kept on until wine gardens fairly finally closed down the lunch counter. Uh, those who were put in jail had to be gotten out of jail. And so my wife and two or three of the neighbors and I uh, went around raising money to get them out of jail. And we finally did get them all out of jail, and we got their records clear. And that was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was that although a civil rights bill had been passed, and I believe that was passed in 1964, uh, there had not been any desegregation of the Houston schools. And so uh, we tried to, to appeal uh, to the schools in Houston that since there was a civil rights bill that now outlawed segregation uh, couldn't, the, couldn't the schools here desegregate? They refused. There was a black member of the board, it was Hattie Mae White, and she was all alone. Uh, there was no one else who would vote for the, desegreg uh, the desegregation of the schools except her. And so we decided, well then, we, we'll protest. We'll just parade down to the school building. So we did. Uh, and there were hundreds of us, I can't remember how many, but there were hundreds of us who formed a parade and went down to, to, the school, to the school district board. And when we got there, uh, the, the superintendent simply closed the building. 
rather than to let us come in and create a, a lot of difficulty inside the school district building. Uh, but after that, uh, they did decide we would desegregate one grade at a time. And they started this slow process of desegregating the kindergarten and then the first grade, and we couldn't accept that. And so, uh, so we formed uh, another protest against them. And that protest at least forced them to begin to desegregate. Uh, there was a different way in which they did it, and that's, that's not a part of your question, so I won't go into that. But that's basically how the, uh, the bailing of the kids out of jail happened. That's basically how the desegregation of schools happened. Thank you for helping us to, to understand that. I wanted to ask you a little bit about today, living in Houston. What do you hope that today's Houstonians take from our reflection of what we talked about, especially the celebration of King's life, and use it to better or maintain what has happened in the past for African Americans living here? Well, quite honestly, the Houston of 2010 is far different from the Houston of 1955 when I first came here. Uh, things were totally segregated then. Things are fairly, we're fairly well totally integrated now. There's almost no place where a black person cannot go in and spend money or, or use whatever the services are. And with a black president in the White House and with a gay mayor, it seems to me that we are now beginning to look at, uh, at, at minority subcommunities in a wholly different way. Houston is an extremely diverse city, and it would be very difficult to have, de to have segregation against some one of us uh, without uh, creating problems with Hispanics and women and, and, and gays. So I think that, that it's important now that we do realize that in this diverse city, we should move forward rather than backward. Reverend Lawson, I want to thank you. It's been really an honor, more than a pleasure, to really sit and have you that was so much a part of movements of um, making Houston overall just a better place for everyone to live in. And thank you so much for sharing and just an enlightening moment to sit here and talk with you today. And thank you most of all for allowing Houston Public Library to record this as history. Well, thank you for coming to my home and thank you for coming to talk to me. Thank you.